Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, when he gets invited to a potluck, he brings actual food tokens. It's Matt Morgan. So Joey, I recently saw a typo on someone's tombstone. I thought, oh boy, that's a grave mistake right there. Hey, I actually, I was with you the whole time. I followed that one. I even knew the punchline before you said it. And this has never happened before in the history of this channel. So I'm proud of myself. Well, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, they did spell rest in peace correctly. Um, so I'm sorry to, to bring that, that little tidbit up though. Yeah. I, I, I'm, as long as we're not using this as a reason to exile my graveyards, leave me to my necromancy, Matt. That's, that's fine. That's okay. The, I think they'll live this one down. That's fine. There it is. There it is. Up next, whenever he cracks a clue token, he has to quote a line from the 1985 movie Clue. It's Dana Roach. Um, did you know that Vin Diesel only eats two meals a day? Uh, this has something to do with family. I'm sure of it. What's going uh, on? I mean, Dana? breakfast and uh, breakfurious. <laughs> there it is. There it is. We tickled Joey. This is the EDH <laughs> we, <rec> cast. <laughs> we broke Joey. <laughs> that's the best. That's so good. Oh, I'm delighted. Um, my my is... son submitted that. So there you go. Well, uh, kudos, kudos. A, a son anyway, dad joke. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> anyway, this is the EDH RecCast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we like to do is absolutely slay Joey with really terrible jokes, but we also like to give all of that data a little more context. Matt, do you mind telling us what it is that we'll be talking about in this week's episode? This week, we are going to talk about all the decks that we just couldn't quite make work. We tried, we gave the A plus effort, but in the end, we just, we couldn't make it to a place where we want it to be. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a, this will be a very interesting episode for sure, because there's just that point, I feel, where a deck finally clicks, but these are some that wound up on the cutting room floor, and we want to kind of examine why that is the case and what lessons we learned from trying to explore all of those different things. It should be really interesting. Real quick, before we get into our main topic, let's pause and thank Chase, aka Mana Curves, for assisting us with the post-production of the podcast, and of course, we want to thank our sponsors for the show as well. The EDH Recast is sponsored by Car Kingdom and TCG Player, the spaghetti and garlic bread of card vendors. Uh, just go to EDH Rec and click on the card in question, choose the vendor link down below, and select your choice. Doing so supports both the site and the show. And if you would prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, where we have patron tiers of all sorts of levels. Whether you want to see all the historic challenge stats picks that we've done over the years, you want to see all the episodes a day early, maybe even, or you want that coveted weekly shout out that we do, there's all these tiers and more over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. And this week, that very, very coveted spot is going to go to Jose Gomez. So Jose, thank you so much for your support. It's definitely appreciated. And we, uh, we are just we're just glad that you're around give a heartfelt message this week <laughs> yeah thank you so much jose super all the love this the support is really wonderful thank you everyone you make the show happen it's super terrific okay let's get into our main topic now here we are talking about those decks we couldn't quite make work they just for one reason or another we couldn't quite get them to click. And, and I think actually, before we even get to some specific examples, it's probably worthwhile for us to mention that just because we didn't make these decks click for us doesn't mean these commanders don't work at all. This is a lot more of a personal journey. There are definitely going to be tons of players out there who have made the commanders that we'll discuss in this episode work for them, but there might be some different reason why they weren't personally satisfying for us. So this is more of a personal journey and personal explorations and things that we're looking for from commanders. So I don't know, Dana, if you were trying to build some very popular deck, for example, like let's say that you were trying to build a Joda deck as an example, like we already know that wouldn't work for you, even though it works for thousands of other players, you know, but that's just because of a personal preference on your side. So that's just a thing that we should, a caveat, a disclaimer, we should probably make immediately. Yeah, this definitely is an episode where we're not going to give a whole lot of EDH rec data specifically. We're just going to talk about our deck building processes, uh, very, very subjective as it were, because yeah, this... It's stuff that this isn't to say, like Joey said, that these aren't very, very popular decks or commanders or whatever. It's just stuff that we couldn't get to a place that was fun for us personally to play. So the, the first one, I guess, for me that comes to mind here 
is I, I tried for a while to make Timrat the Murder King work and was just never able to turn the corner with it the way I wanted to. Um, for those who don't remember, because Timurat at this point, Theros is, you know, eight-ish years ago now. I was going to say. Yeah, uh, Timurat's a, a 2-2 zombie warrior. He's cheap to cast, just just Rakdos color, so a black and a red. And you can recast him from the graveyard for, for one and a black if you sacrifice a creature. But the, the more relevant ability on his card is you can spend one and a red to sacrifice another creature. And Timurat the Murder King deals two damage to target player. So my plan or what I wanted to do with this deck, I was going to run a bunch of creatures with Infect or or the old school poisonous version of that. So oh. things that would deal poison damage to a person, things like Swamp Mosquito or Plague Stinger, because um, <laughs> those had evasion as well. That helped to get a few poison counters on folks and then proliferate those poison counters with things like Contagion Clasp or Volt Charge, and then finish someone off with Timuret, who I would give in fact with things like Glistening Oil or Phyresis or Grafted Exoskeleton. <laughs> so there's multiple ways you can give a creature in fact. I would give Timuret in fact, and then use his sacrifice ability to, you know, put multiple poison counters on someone once I've already given them a few of those creatures. That was kind of like my finisher or if the board got clogged up enough that I couldn't poke through with that fearsome swamp mosquito, um, <laughs> I could use Terminus as a finisher. First of all, fearsome swamp mosquito. I need that to be like my new username. <laughs> That's absolutely terrific. Uh, but second of all, I remember you uh, testing this one out against us on our stream, twitch.tv slash EDH Recast, where you can watch us play EDH every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Plug, plug, plug. I'm very subtle about this. Uh, but yeah, your, your Timurite deck did have um, a lot of interesting capabilities with that damage ability, like direct damage, making it infect. You only have to sacrifice five creatures and you'll just get someone completely out of the game and proliferate's going to speed that along. I mean, it sounds in theory like a deck that ought to work the way that you've described it. Yeah, um in theory, the operative words there. <laughs> um and, and there were okay. there were some things that did work quite well. Um for example, one card that like was super effective in the deck was Arc Bond uh, from from I believe Fate Reforged. Um it's an instant for two and a red. You choose target creature, or whenever that creature is dealt damage this turn, it deals that much damage to each other creature or player. So plenty of times I'd be in a situation where people had, you know, say four or five poison counters on, on them, and I would put Infect on Timuret and swing at somebody knowing that, okay, they're going to block with their 5-5 five, five or something, and then cast Arc Bond to make that creature deal damage to each, to each other creature and each player. I would probably be at zero poison, and everyone else would be at like five or six. And oftentimes I could just kill the table if I was in the right position where someone had a creature that, that was less than 10 power, so it wasn't going to put 10 poison on me. Um, being able to stick that arc bond out when someone had something with five or six power was a, a really good way to close out a game. So there were times everything worked. The problem was I was trying to do too many things simultaneously, and the deck kind of required too many things simultaneously. I needed sack fodder for Timuret, so I needed things like Bitter Blossom that made tokens, so I had multiple things I could sacrifice, maybe a Blood Gas that I could recur, so I, so I needed some amount of those creatures. I needed the, you know, five or six or seven ways to give Timuret Infect or Poisonous. I needed multiple ways to proliferate things. It, for, for the most part, it, like, it was 120 cards I was trying to cram into 100 slots. And to a degree, that's always a problem with Commander decks. You're, you're, you're always struggling to make those last cuts. This was really, like, I really, in order to make the deck work, I just needed that many slots, and I didn't have them. So it was really difficult to get the correct sequence of cards in the right order very often to make all of the things happen. And it was just so easy to disrupt. There was just so many ways along that road where something could break down and go wrong, and just routinely, that's what happened. So, Dana, knowing you as well as I think I do, uh, but maybe for the listeners more, do you think that problem that you mentioned of the deck had too many things going on and everything needed to be going right, do you think you find that in a lot of your decks? Because you kind of famously are known for going off the beaten path. You're not playing commanders that are very popular. You're not playing popular strategies. Or if you are, you're, you're doing it in different ways. Do you think that problem comes along in a lot of your brews? 
when a deck doesn't work more often than not, that's the reason for me it didn't work. Because mm. I was trying to do something that just required so many moving pieces and I'm just not able to assemble that kind of clockwork engine in the right way. So yeah, absolutely, that's definitely something that occurs. Yeah. And the one other thing I would note about this particular deck too that was a problem, people don't like Infect. <laughs> and once they realize that's happening, they tend to turn on the deck very quickly. And it was not one that could handle that level of focus. So that was also a problem. A, a deck that needed to work that well and was that easy to disrupt also did a thing that made people want to disrupt it. So that was, there was an added layer of difficulty there where, it, yeah, that it was just prone to um, people throwing any kind of, any kind of problem they could into the, the, the works of, of the whole engine. I, I have noticed that uh, issue with my Veerdus deck because I'm poking people and cutting their life in half. And that also, for some reason, completely unbeknownst to me, is not a thing that people like to witness when their life total drops in half from just a single 1-1 one, one attacking them. Uh, it seems to be the kind of thing that draws a whole lot of ire. And thankfully, in that <laughs> deck, I do feel as though I have enough slots to uh, provide a whole bunch of extra clever fogs and different ways to prevent people from attacking me, which I know that they will. Um because, you know, I've drawn so much attention to myself, but I can totally see how in the deck you just described, where you're trying to make sure that you have a lot of sacrifice fodder and a lot of infect enablers and the cards that will help you find those things and then extra tricks on top of that, you are still struggling to find, in addition to all of that, defenses as well as board removal effects and mana acceleration effects and a degree of card advantage that keeps your engine running without sputtering out completely and enough lands. Like, yeah, I can see how this is kind of a too many cooks situation. It really also didn't take that long to realize all of these problems. I think I had the deck together from from when I put the cards in the deck to when I just took it apart it was about six weeks. Uh, it was it was readily apparent very quickly what the problem was, and it was pretty apparent over the course of the next you know five or six weeks. There was just no way to fix that problem and have the deck do what I wanted it to do. Uh, so so yeah, the the lifespan of it was uh, pretty limited as well. I just I could see the problems quickly, and I could see that I couldn't fix them very quickly. I, I also feel like compared to what Joey said about his Virus and Gorm deck, Timurit being in red and black specifically, you're kind of limited. Like the the color combination is not very popular when you look at it. Whereas if you would have access to blue or or red, green compared to the Virus and Gorm deck, I think it might have opened up a few more doors for the, the deck to really operate? The, the commander made sense for what I wanted to do, but the color combination didn't necessarily lend itself really well to doing those things. I, yeah. I totally get that, yeah. I, I can totally see that happening. So, okay, now, Matt, I guess it's... Uh, we, we saw with Dana, it was a case of too many cooks. What's a deck for you that didn't ever quite click, couldn't make it work, and, you know, what was the culprit behind that? Well, if we want to talk about color combinations that didn't really lend themselves to uh, what what you wanted to be doing with the deck. I really, really wanted to make an Araumi Enchantress type of deck, oh. and that really never came together. Um, for those of you who don't know, Araumi of the Dead Tide uh, was from Commander Legends. It's one blue and a black for a legendary merfolk wizard that's a 1-4, and then you can tap it and exile cards from your graveyard equal to the number of opponents that you have and then target creature card in your graveyard gains Encore until the end of turn, and the Encore cost is equal to its mana cost, where with Encore you get to exile that creature and you pay its mana cost, and then you get to create a copy of, or a token copy, I should say, uh, and then put it onto the battlefield, and then uh, you have to attack those opponents if able, gives them haste. It's a pretty cool effect, and I really liked the ability constellation back from the original Theros block, now that we're coming full circle here. So I really want to do things like Grim Guardian, mm. uh, Doomwake Giants, and all these ways to trigger just a massive amount of Constellation triggers every turn. But then the more I realize that Encore, A, around me has to tap in order to do that ability, so you can only do it once per turn, unless you're doing Intruder Alarm type of nonsense. But then you get into <laughs> a combo deck, and I don't really like combo decks all that much. But also, you run out of resources so stinking fast when you're doing that. Oh. And yeah, so you have to get into, you know, traumatize yourself to give yourself access or doing some sort of buried alive type of shenanigans. And I, I'm not the necromancer on the podcast, so <laughs> my, my knowledge of this, this realm is, is fairly limited. But I really like the idea of it, and I've been tinkering around with it, but I still, I just cannot get it to a place where I even want to buy the cards. Dang. So 
I mean, in, in this case, it kind of sounds like you're having the opposite problem as Dana. Like you are trying to go for a niche strategy, but the issue you're running into is that it's maybe too niche. Like there aren't enough constellation effects for you to get as many rewards as you want. Like, don't get me wrong. It sounds amazing to get three copies of Doomwake Giant into play all at once so that they each see each other with the constellationiness, and then they each give minus one. Like that's going to wipe the entire board. Yes. Or Grim Guardian was the other one you said. Like each one of them will see the others hit. So that's going to be a bunch of life drain from your opponents. Those sound rad. And that also sounds like that's it. I don't know what other constellation creatures there are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's stuff like Agent of Erebos and some other. But the, the A, the, the card pool is just so limited in only blue and black colors. Yeah. That was the, the first and biggest stumbling block that I came across with making the deck work. But also, it wasn't even the most efficient. Like, I, I found, I kind of accidentally stumbled upon, oh, well, if I just encore out this consuming aberration and cast a spell, oh. then I'm going to mill everybody out pretty much. So there there was just so many more efficient ways of winning that I found, even though I was just putting consuming aberration in there just because I was like, okay, I'm going to use that to hopefully get myself some stuff. But then I was like, oh, yeah, I reread consuming aberration and the cast, whenever you cast a spell ability didn't work the way I thought it did. So yeah, nothing about this deck has really come together yet. I'm hoping maybe for some Commander Legend stuff we get some more help, but this is, like Dana pointed out, with Timurit being in red and black, being in Demir colors specifically and trying to make Enchantress strategies work, the pieces just aren't there. One of the things that works really well with Selesnya Enchantress is everything your card draw is taken yeah right everything <laughs> but i mean like yeah basically because your card draw is taken care of by the things you're running you're going to run a handful of enchantress creatures possibly even one in the command zone and as you cast those spells that are moving you towards winning the game they're also like d drawing you cards along the way so you don't for the most part need to worry about devoting specific slots to card draw because those enchantress are going to do it for you Whereas here, you don't have almost any of the enchantresses available to you. So it's that many additional slots you have to devote to things like card draw mm. that you just don't have to worry about elsewhere. So you're not getting that kind of double up effect that you get in Selesnya where one or two cards can do double duty, both as you know something that can wear a bunch of enchantments and that are drawing you cards along the way. Totally agreed, Dana. And I found when uh, Tatsunari Toad Rider was even previewed, that kind of shored up what I was looking to do, but then that added another color. That became a Soul Tide deck instead of just straight Demir, mm. which I could still run around me in and put that into a Tatsunari deck. But then I, I kind of have the same avoidance as you do, Dana, for adding a third color. If I'm doing it, it has to be for a really good reason. And then it just turns into a Soul Tide deck. I already have a, I already have a Soul Tide deck. But B, it just seemed like it was giving me all of the answers. It was here's all the tools you don't need to work mm. because yes, it, it, being able to use Aramis Encore ability and putting out an idol of blossoms, then yeah, I, I have all the answers right there. But training wheels seems like too harsh of a term to say, but also adding green just seemed very, very easy because there isn't anything green can't do, especially in an Enchantress deck. So that was one thing that I, I, I've been trying to avoid I may give in. I don't know. <laughs> I I can't even stand up to my dog, so I probably can't stand up to a toad either. So, <laughs> No, I, I totally get it, though. Like, the thing that you wanted was, ooh, Demir Enchantress. I've never heard of that. Like, that's the reaction that you're hoping to get when you play that deck. But if you were to build it as Tatsunari, you'd be like, Sultai Enchantress with Tatsunari. And the reaction you'd get would be like, yeah, that's what that deck is. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I look forward to playing it. Sure. But, like, it is not the thing that you were after in the first place. The thing that you were after was, like, can I pull this off? And, unfortunately, it doesn't look like all of the support is there. So the answer, the thing that you wanted is its own biggest issue like the stumbling block is the thing is the block basically yeah it just there there are several issues with doing around me but yeah the big ones were the card pool is fairly fairly limited uh, it just does the one thing and and yeah having around me have to tap outside of some combo shenanigans that's the worst part is you may as well just be playing a combo deck because around me is very very powerful <laughs> but yeah if, if you're doing consuming aberration with high tide that's just a whole other deck all things considered Oh, man. So it's funny you should mention combo because I'll move to my uh, submission here for a deck that I could never quite make work. And it involves a degree of combo winding up in the 99. This is Asmira Holy Avenger. Matt, 
I'm so glad that you talked about a Demir deck because I was trying to build a Selesnia deck at one point. Can you believe it? Who are we? What have we done with Joey Schultz and Mr. Matt Selesnia, man? The old, the old swapsies. That's what we did. Yeah. Exactly. We we were trying to do things in slightly different colors, but man, these ones are tough. Asmira, Holy Avenger, is a four mana, two, three, uh, Selesnia legend with flying. And at the end of each turn, you put a plus one, plus one counter onto Asmira, Holy Avenger for each creature that was put into your graveyard from play that turn. And I really wanted to make this work. I wanted to do Selesnia Aristocrats because I'm so used to playing my Orzhov Aristocrats and my Golgari Aristocrats and frankly, even my Demir Aristocrats I, and Mono Black Aristocrats. It's a, a strategy I'm very familiar with and like, can I pull it off in these colors? And there are like 143 Asmira decks on EDH Rec right now. So folks have definitely done it. But I ran into some issues with this one. First of all, there's a small number of sacrifice outlets that are meaningful in these colors. There are some cool ones. Fanatical Devotion is a personal favorite. Three mana white enchantment that lets you sacrifice creatures to regenerate creatures. That's really great. Martyr's Cause is another really fun one. Spawning Pit, another personal favorite, an artifact that just lets you sacrifice stuff to build up a couple of counters on it and make some tokens sometimes maybe. But like, oh, those are great sacrifice uh, outlets for sure. The issue is I ran into this problem of, okay, but what's my reward for sacrificing? I get my commander kind of big sometimes. Why? What, 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 what am I actually, what is the benefit that I'm getting? Is a slightly bigger commander? Yeah. Um, I guess there's commander damage that I can look forward to, but it the, it gets kind of slim really fast. So then I was like, oh, maybe I need to find more rewards for all these things dying. Like fecundity, for example, draws cards whenever creatures die. But the issue is that it's a symmetrical effect and my opponent started taking advantage of it more than me. And again, I was only getting a few plus one counters onto my commander. And if I had a bunch of tokens to sacrifice, why wasn't I pumping up all of my tokens and attacking with them instead of trying to put a couple of plus one counters onto my commander? So it, it could never quite work until I found the one thing that would make it work best of all and matt it was a combo <laughs> mm. um if, if i wanted to get as many plus one counters as possible onto Asmira, well i would kind of have to fall into step when it comes to cards like safi eric's daughter renegade rallier and revel arc which can all revive each other sacrifice each other bring each other back and you can do this there's like this infinite combo that you can pull off with these effects which will then have Asmira see a bunch of death and you'll get infinite plus one counters onto your commander and that is definitely a way to make this deck effective but the issue is that's not what I wanted. I didn't want an infinite combo in the deck. I wanted to do aristocracy stuff, and instead I wound up with a combo deck. And that was a journey I was not prepared for. <laughs> well, and and with Asmira specifically, yes, you, you're right. You, you you can make Asmira just infinitely big if you want. But the problem with Asmira that I think is holding her back quite a bit is the timing of it, where yeah. at, 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 that happens at the end step, not whenever a creature dies. So yes, you can do that and, and make Asmira, you know, crazy huge but then you have to wait a turn and that's the that's the sticky part yeah it, it's and it's also again a little bit of a some more problem that i had with my timurid deck you just don't have enough slots <laughs> yes. you need x amount of, you need x amount of sack colors you need x amount of things that make multiple creatures for you to sacrifice to to his mirror you're going to need ways to protect a commander that's going to get that big, probably similar to Timurad. Mm -hmm. You're just there, there's a lot of things you're trying to jam into this deck to make it work the way you want it to work, and there's frankly not enough slots for that many different threads you're trying to tug on. Oh, oh yeah. As soon as it becomes obvious that the goal is actually supposed to be like a really big commander, I have to protect the combo pieces. I probably have to like find tutors for the combo pieces. I have to find things that will give my commander protection as well to make sure that it doesn't die. I have to time it all right. I still have to find the sacrifice outlets. Like it's so many plates. And again, you still need the things like the card jaw and you need the mana accelerations and you need all of those. And, and it's kind of interesting because I feel like I've gone on a similar journey with Asmira as I did with the card of Vishkal, which is a vampire deck that, well, not a vampire travel deck, but he's a really cool vampire that I also wanted to to make work and he is a sacrifice outlet that also gets a bunch of plus one counters onto him and man i love vishkal the problem is he's seven mana the problem is he's seven mana and he effectively like he wants you to have a big board of tokens so that you can put a bunch of plus one counters onto him with his sacrifice effect but again it's that issue of well if i have a big board of tokens why am i sacrificing them to make one big commander why am i not doing an attack step with all of my tokens play it just all gold made and make them all really really big and that was the other contradiction of these decks that i kept running into is that it was an aristocrats deck that really could just be very efficient at having big board go smash and so it's a, a, a weird journey with these decks for sure that accidentally wound me into like token strategies and combos when I could never pull off the aristocrats thing the way that I really wanted it to happen which is a shame because I do otherwise really like Esmira still um maybe I still hold out hope but I just uh, I, I tried for like two years with this deck and I could never make it work 
Well, at least in the case of Vishkal, where you wanted to make a big board of tokens and do all that, Felice, which was our preview card a few years ago when Commander Legends was previewed, hey. at least slides into that spot. It enables you in the same colors to do that same strategy. So you at least have something you can transition into that isn't, like you said, uh, ju- that isn't a billion mana effectively. <laughs> but with Asmira, there there isn't really a great Selesnia. There's getting a, there's a few options that are getting better, but Asmira, there really isn't a good Selesnia aristocrats style commander. Uh, Drizzt is better ish, but still not great. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I just think it's so funny. Here's this is the weird winding route that sometimes these decks take. Like, Dana, when you mentioned your Timurat deck, I think I'd be fairly confident in saying that the soul of that Timurat deck eventually became your jury master of the review deck. Would that be accurate? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and for me, a Selesnia aristocrat strategy eventually led to me making an Orzov tokens deck <laughs> where I had Azmira, and eventually that actually became Felice Reverend Medium in my case. The deck journeys that we go on in this game are wild, y'all. Yeah, and for me, just instead of Demir Enchantress, I just gave up and just bought a precon instead. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Perfectly respectable, honestly. Because like knowing when not to choose, like picking the right battles, that is a good EDH oh. skill and is a good deck building skill too. As as a connoisseur of the combat step, I pick my battles in and out of the game very well. I, I know when to sit down and All shut right. up. That's almost as <laughs> useful of a skill as being able to challenge some stats. Hey, you saw where I was going, Dana. Very nice. Yeah, so those were some early examples. We each have another example coming up in the second part of the show. But yeah, let's pause and challenge some statistics because it's just one of our favorite things to do here on the show. There's so much data on EDHREC, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards see too much or too little play, so we love to challenge those stats. Dana, how about you start us off this week? I will start us off with a enchantment from way back in the Ice Age days, of course. Um, glacial crevasses, two and a red. What? Um, <laughs> I believe it's pr- yes. I believe it's crevassier is Cre- the actual. Crevassier, sorry, <laughs> crevassier. <laughs> crevassier, glacial, glacial crevassier. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> glacial crevasses for the listeners at home. Glacial crevasses. <laughs> no, I, I, I was just astonished that you have once again found a card I've never heard of. <laughs> just sorry. <laughs> so this is a two and a red for an enchantment. Um, Sacrifice a snow mountain and prevent all combat damage that will be dealt this turn. Because when you think of red, you think of fog effects. Of course. This is a brutally effective card. It's only in 450 decks right now on EDH Rec. Um, You probably want to limit it for the most part to a mono red deck. But snow lands are relatively cheap after a reprint um, in, in Kaldheim as well as Modern Horizons 2. It's pretty easy to just run Snowlands in your mono red deck. And when you land this card, you can definitely buy yourself three or four or five turns without much of a problem where you just blank everyone's swings on you. There's no activated cost on this either, so you don't need to leave mana free. You just you can sacrifice a tapped Snow Mountain if you need to. It's a really useful effect in an aggressive red deck where you might oftentimes lead yourself open with your attacks for a counterattack. Dropping this, unless someone has enchantment removal, you can keep yourself safe for more than enough turns most of the time. Is this mono red spore frog? Dana, I feel like you found mono red spore frog. Basically, yeah. There, it, it's that's functionally what it winds up being. <laughs> There's actually a a artifact version of this as well from Ice Age. Sunstone um, that costs three mana, um, and you can sacrifice any snow covered land, but it has an activated ability, uh, costs two mana to use. So, I mean, you could also run Sunstone in your mono red deck as well, or in any deck basically that has snow lands. But the beauty of, of Glacial Crevices is you don't have an activated cost on it. You can just sacrifice a snow mountain and not have to worry about keeping mana up. So, um, it's better than Sunstone, although Sunstone's not terrible either. But they both definitely should see more play, I think, particularly crevices in a mono red deck. Wow. All right. Uh, mind blown, as always. Uh, I might need to finish up a Card Kingdom order before <laughs> I uh, finish this podcast. So don't mind me, Matt. How about while I'm ordering some cards, you go ahead and tell us about your challenge. So my challenge this week actually comes from one of our listeners. So uh, my life is John C., who is in our Discord community, which you can join over at patreon.com slash edhretcast, had a pretty saucy challenge this week, actually, that I hadn't really considered too much, but then 
reading it back. It, it's a good, good idea. Uh, so John, uh, my life is John C uh, submitted unnatural aggression as the card. And they say uh, it's two and a green for an instant, but it has devoid. So it has technically no color and it makes target creature you control fight a creature your opponent controls. And if the creature your opponent controls dies this way, it gets exiled instead of going to the graveyard. Uh, so they also noted that it's only currently in under 700 decks and it's a very low counter or very low number for mono greens that struggle sometimes to exile problem creatures. So if you're playing something like maybe Naeth of the Dire Hunt, maybe that loves, 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 loves to have creatures fight, this is a very good option, especially when they note it's also an instant speed effect that is, uh, you're able to do this for only three mana. Uh, being uh, It works as a nice combat trick, get last points of damage in if blocking didn't get it done. Uh, and the cherry on top of it is it has no color. So you, uh, if you're worrying about any color protection, you're able to get around that. So I really like this. The point about being able to exile creatures that you're fighting, that's sometimes huge in commander games. Uh, if you're playing any sort of necromancer at the table, they're going to be able to recur some of these creatures. So just getting them off the battlefield and out of the graveyards is super important. So Unnatural Aggression, I really like this if you're playing any sort of fight deck. But like I said, Naeth of the Dire Hunt is only playing this in about 16% of decks, and Naeth is fairly popular. So if you're needing an extra fight spell, look for Unnatural Aggression. It's probably going to be a good fit. It, it just occurred to me, the protection thing from colors, I mean, the creature that it's fighting would probably have a color, so you'd have to watch out for that. Yes, yeah, so you do have to worry about your own creatures having a certain color. Uh, they still can just give the creature protection from whatever color that it, uh, the creatures that they're fighting. So yes, that is something you do need to look out for. But if there's anything color specific about the spells that you're casting, Devoid is a nice little thing. And Devoid, I almost sometimes forget that it's even a mechanic. But there are sometimes some very, very strange times that stuff's working and you want to have, or you actually you don't want to have colors, I should say. Yeah, the exile part strikes me as one of the more interesting things there for sure. But I will say the protection point does kind of come up in my challenge. So it's funny that we're on a wavelength here, Matt, uh, because I would like to talk about a challenge for the commander Gallia Kindler of Hope, which is the Bont commander. I know you all say Bant. It is a commander of white and green and blue uh, <laughs> that cares a lot about auras and equipment. And it is a really popular commander for sure. There are over 2,700 decks to Galia's name, but some of them are including some swords that I do want to put a little bit of caution against. So cards like Sword of Feast and Famine and Sword of Hearth and Home, for example, are showing up in 27 and 19% of Galia decks respectively. And these are phenomenal swords. Like we've all seen these in action. Sword of Feast and Famine, Pro Green, Pro Black, and it's going to untap your lands when it hits stuff. Amazing stuff. Sort of Hearth and Home, finding you extra lands, maybe getting you some extra into the battlefield effects. Those are terrific to be sure. But in a Galia deck specifically, I would kind of caution against protection effects such as these swords, especially since they're so expensive, because they do kind of negate some of the other cards that you're playing. For example, Galia decks are really fond of playing cards like Shielding Plaques or equipment like Behemoth Sledge and Belt of Giant Strength, which are equipment but are also equipment that have a color. Shielding Plaques is also a green aura. And if you're playing stuff that gives you protection from green, then you're not going to be able to suit those onto Galia. Or if they're already suited onto Galia, then they'll fall right off. So protection equipment can be a thing that get in the way of your own strategy. And this definitely seems to me like a deck that will kind of always have that issue with protection effects because of how many auras that it wants to play. So in terms of things, you know, giving protection from colors, this strikes me as a thing that you want to be pretty cautious about with your ratios of auras and how many of those protection effects that you actually want to play in the deck when you do have so many of those equipments that have a color or auras that have a color along with them. You know, when you're trying to balance out your most powerful swords and your most powerful auras, do they contradict each other? Because in some cases, they might. So you got to watch out for it. I would say in a general sense, in any equipment deck, you should pay attention to what colors the, you know, swords of punch and face <laughs> in your equipment deck are, are granting. Um, they can get in the way a surprising amount of times. I, I have to be cautious in my equipment deck. I'm running a card vanish into memory, for example, in mine that I oftentimes use to blink out one of my large creatures wearing a bunch of swords to draw a bunch of cards, Ooh. but it doesn't work if it's wearing a sword that gives that creature protection from white or protection from blue. Um, so just in a general sense, you probably need to be cautious of what those swords are giving your creature protection from. 
that's your own stuff that it might prevent you from using. I, I know I for sure have accidentally done that with my Valduck deck. Uh, I love Sword of War and Peace, but the problem is gives Enchanted Creature Protection from red, and if you have any red auras on Valduck, that doesn't add up well for you. <laughs> very, very much. But hey, uh, Matt, you know what you should now be afraid of um, is Glacial Crevices, which can fog all of your <laughs> all of your Valduk and all of your, your elementals there. there there's because, a lot to be afraid of in this format. Because Dana has once again found diamonds in the rough. The, I'm... Need to, I need to focus on this show. Sorry, this is a very cool card, Dana. I like your challenge a lot. All right, uh, let's get back into our topic here. And Dana, I am actually going to pass it back to you. Tell us about another deck of yours that never quite got past the good part of the brewing stage that you eventually had to discard. Why didn't the deck work? What was it? Um, so I built a Kenrith, the Return King Exalted deck. Um, Exalt is one of my favorite mechanics, and I, I've always, I've tried multiple times to make it work with different commanders. I think the Kenrith was my most recent uh, attempt um, to run five color Exalted. So I basically had every creature with Exalted, or there's a couple that have Exalted without actually using the keyword. Um, I had all of them in the deck. So the plan was, you know, Kenrith has useful abilities to give those creatures trample or haste or to let me draw cards if I need to, whatever. Um, the plan was to have this, this suite of exalted creatures, and then I would just attack with whatever the most appropriate one was at the time. You know, if it if it had evasion, I would swing at someone with evasion. If I if I didn't need the evasion, I could swing at someone with a bigger body, whatever. Um there, there would be basically no like, despite having the king as my commander, there would be no king in the deck. Any any creature could kind of carry the sword. Of exalted forward and and swinging for lethal damage, or so I thought. <laughs> um, oh, no. There there were there were two problems with the deck. Um, first of all, I, I just hated hearing the words. Oh, a Kenrith deck. I have one of those too, <laughs> and that's that's not a problem, I guess, of how the deck was brewed. Um, but it, it it bothered me. It was such a popular commander, one of the most popular commanders of all time, that the fact that Everyone had a Kenrith deck, just kind of annoyed me. Um, so, so I guess that was a problem mentally. Um, in terms of deck construction, however, <laughs> um, Kenrith is also a really good card. And my hope of being able to swing in with whatever random exalted creature was out that fit the situation best just want to be in Kenrith every single time. Right. Um, that That's always been a problem, really, with Exalted decks. That was always the issue with Rafik decks, where, like, you were better off just leaning into attacking with Rafik and buffing him up any way you wanted to. Exalted was kind of the worst way to do it. And that wanted to be the case with Kenrith, too. You're just better off swinging with Kenrith and utilizing his abilities. And that just kind of made the deck not feel like the Exalted deck I had hoped it would wind up being. And that's always kind of been the problem when I've tried to build an Exalted deck, is, is whatever commander I've chosen winds up being just the best thing every single time to swing with. I love that I accidentally did a foreshadowing when I mentioned a five-color commander <laughs> at the beginning yeah. of this episode to be like, you know, here's a really popular five-color commander that someone like Dana would probably like, oh, I can't make it work. And then lo and behold, here we are with Dana naming a five-color commander that he doesn't, you know, it didn't quite make work. Not because the commander doesn't work, but because of this very specific niche thing that you're trying to do. It, it would literally make me sigh. I would just go, ugh. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I have a Kenneth. Okay. Your thematic preoccupations never cease to amaze, rest assured. But can I just mention the iconicness of you saying, and another deck construction problem that I had with this deck was that Kenrith is a good card. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is also kind of ridiculous. But it, it was a good card in a way that made the deck not work the way I wanted it to work, I guess. I get you. Um, and, and that's not to say it wouldn't work. Like there, I won games with it. Um one card that really stood out was Seize the Day. It's it's a way to get an extra combat step in red, and it has flashbacks, so, so there are plenty of times you can get two extra combat steps. Um, there will be situations where I would have a shot at somebody, and I would give, you know, I would swing with Kenrith, who would get, you know, plus 10, plus 10 or something crazy from all the different Exalted triggers. I, I could give him Trample and perhaps kill somebody, um, cast Seize the Day, swing at somebody else then, mm. and the way Exalted works, it would trigger again. So he'd go from, you know, a 10, 10, or 11, 11 to a, you know, 20, 20 or something that still has Trample, kill somebody, 
come back. I could flash back, seize the day, and now he's a 30-30 swinging against somebody else. <laughs> um, so the deck definitely worked. It just didn't kind of do what I wanted to do. And, and I tinkered around with it for, I mean, I, I think three months trying different things. The Kenrith being popular thing, I really couldn't do very much about. <laughs> um, but but I, I just tried different combinations of cards, different things um, to make the deck less Kenrith focused. And I, I just couldn't do it. It's just such a useful card that the deck just always wound up revolving around Kenrith. Matt, Matt, I, I, I need. I feel like I need your help. Are we, are we, or are we not having an old man yells at cloud moment here? Yeah, he like, totally says that these cards are good. Are, we completely. I, I'm not going to deny that. Absolutely. We, this is where we insert the uh, the DJ call it like congratulations. You played yourself, meme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. Like that. That. That's. That's what I feel like happens with so many of Dana's ideas. The, it just he you get halfway through the the brewing process and you just scoff at yourself. Why am I wasting my time? Well, it, <laughs> I, I will. In my defense, I will say I guess it's not that much different than Joey's is Mira deck where it turned into a combo deck. Like you made that deck work, it just didn't work the way you wanted it to work. Right. To a degree, that's what happened here. It, it worked. It just didn't work the way I wanted it to work. Where I had envisioned this deck where any of these Agalta creatures could wind up kind of being the the lead role. And that that's not what happened. So um, yeah, it was effective, but not effective the way I wanted it to be effective. Yeah, I I, I love that. There's there's a, a big lesson to be had here when you're trying to do something cutesy, but the cards that you're actually playing want to they're pulling you in another direction. They're just like actually I'm powerful right. in a different way, and the the cute tricks are cute, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna. I'm not sure if it's going to work out. Like that's a thing to pay attention to uh, is like when the cards themselves are like, I don't know, you're you're kind of trying to fit a circle into a square hole here, bud. Like this is, this is not, I'm a big circle. So like, yeah, I get it. I mean, so I'll go on to my next deck and I actually had the exact opposite problem as Dana did where he had a deck that worked, but he didn't like the commander at the helm. Whereas I have a commander that I'm going to brute force and make a deck that functions, functions okay. eventually. Uh, but every idea that I've had so far just has not been enjoyable. Uh, so the commander is Glenn, the voice of calm. That's one of the walking dead secret layer cards. I love zombie shows. Walking dead is one of my favorites and Glenn's one of my favorite characters. So I was super stoked when I saw this card, but then the card is just okay. So Glenn oh, is, no, really? Glenn is, is one white and a blue for a one, three legendary human advisor with skulk, which uh, reads, this creature can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. And then whenever Glenn deals combat damage to a player, you draw cards equal to his power. So, I... The, the, the defaults into an Azorius Voltron commander. You can soup him up with all sorts of, of artifacts. I really like Double Strike because it allows you to keep his power low, but you're... And so you can sneak in underneath people with the Skulk ability, but then still draw a lot of cards. But also, it just kind of looks like every other Voltron type of commander, equipment style commander in Azorius colors. Oh. I just, it was really hard to do anything meaningful and incorporate Glenn in any sort of unique way that didn't look like so many other Azorius decks. And maybe that's just me struggling with the blue and white color combination. It's never really spoken to me a whole lot. But the Voltron was definitely not the direction I wanted to go. I've tried, I tried a Disturb deck with all the casting enchantments out of your graveyard type of uh, spells. Uh, but just even looking at the average deck, it's just a pile of kind of good stuff cards in Azorius. You have Stoneforge Mystic, you have Sigarda's Aid, you have mm. all sorts of just your typical blue-white equipment stuff that didn't ever really feel unique and meaningful. And in a way that you couldn't just swap Glenn out for literally any other commander and the deck would just function the same way. Yeah, what th those two abilities, Skulk, and draw cards when hit people, <laughs> those feel like they are fundamentally at odds with each other. Yeah. Like, this is a commander that doesn't want to be yes. uh, very big because of Skulk, and yet this is a commander that wants to be as big as possible because of the draw card's effect. So, uh, yeah, I, I can see... You're right, I don't know how else I would build this other than to be very Voltron-y because, oh, look how many cards! <laughs> yeah, it just became such a weird situation i just i couldn't figure it out because yeah the two abilities are very much at odds with each other for one but also they're not really unique and and, and plus if you're going by way of combat or commander damage i should say through combat it's going to take you at least 10 and a half turns to kill one person <laughs> and that's just 
That's not quite what we call a clock in, <laughs> in, in the biz. And, and I guess like if you wanted to try and be like clever, avoiding the uh, equipment and the auras and all of the pump up stuff, um, like the other solution here might be potentially like combat tricks. Like you use Skulk to get in underneath blockers and then you have cards that will instant speed pump stuff up. Mm -hmm. Or I don't know, Mirror Entity, for example, comes to mind as a thing that you could activate after blockers are declared and, you know, Glenn has snuck on through and then you can use the Mirror Entity to pump everything up and then that would draw you cards and you've taken advantage of the Skulk ability. The issue, though, is that I think a lot of the best cards in that scenario are also going to be expensive and difficult to acquire, like Umazawa Jite, for example. Mm -hmm. Like, that is a good equipment that can instant speed pump up the creature that it is attached to. But that's also, like, what, a 20-plus dollar card at this point, too? And, you know, and again, you're falling into equipment problems. And, th and that turns into kind of what the typical deck is looking like. You have the Stoneforge Mystic to get out your, your swords, your batter skulls, whatever, but then you're making your creatures very big. And combat tricks... Let's just be real with ourselves. Blue-white doesn't do combat tricks all that well. Uh, green and red is kind of that specialty. There are a few in white, but yeah. lordy, if you're trying to make the power big after blocks have not been declared, you're, you're asking for a real tall task. Matt, you mean you don't love Flare of Faith, a two-mana instant that can give something plus three, plus three if it's a human? You don't want to use this in your fantastical Glenn deck? Uh, you gave me one. Now give me ten more, please. Because <laughs> that that's it. Like, you have Defiant Strike. Woo. <laughs> That, that's always kind of been a problem with Azorius, I think, is is win conditions that aren't kind of mm -hmm. either control or combo. And that's really one that I want to stay away from. I, I had, I think I've had at least four or five different versions of this deck on my Moxfield account. Oh, wow. Just trying to find something that works. I went down, I had thorough investigation and trying to do kind of a very thematic uh, venture into the dungeon because in the show, Glenn is kind of the the forager and finding all these things going into dangerous spots and then creating treasures and clues and doing that. But then at the, then it turns into, well, I may as well be playing Smothering Tithe and this is not the type of deck that I want to be playing Smothering Tithe because I'm that's just not the power level I'm going for. So even really committing to a theme, there's not a lot of dungeon cards quite yet to support a full deck. And so it's just everything that I've tried, it's just kind of felt like beating my head against a wall. Oh man, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I, I think... Matt, that what this is telling you, since you can't make this human uh, work, that instead what you ought to do is uh, side with the zombies. Um, as a zombie player myself, I think that it's a high, high uh, I just highly recommend it, um, that you could instead uh, build a lot more zombies and a lot more necromancy. I'm not going to do that because if you've seen the show, the zombies are the bad guys. I haven't seen the show and I resent the idea that zombies are ever the bad guys. I, as a zombie player, will inform you that zombies are the best. You just made yourself the bad. You just made yourself the bad guy. That's what you did. How dare you? How very dare. <laughs> but also, I get it. Uh, and and, it, and it's actually kind of ironic because the next thing that I'm moving into uh, will be a graveyard deck that I couldn't quite make work. Uh, so what? I feel like I'm telling on myself a little bit here. But anyway, I'll move on to um, to one of my examples here. I y'all, I have had a journey with this one. This is Geth, Lord of the Vault, which is a mono black commander that I just I could I could never quite it never quite got what I wanted to. And this is one going back like way early in my commander career, like back in 2013. Um, and it still just never quite hit the right button. So Geth Lord of the Vault was a six mana uh five five legendary zombie with intimidate, so he can only be blocked by uh creatures that are artifact creatures or that share a color with him. He's mono black, so relatively unblockable but the real appeal for him was that you can pay x in a black to put target artifact or creature card with converted mana cost x from an opponent's graveyard onto the battlefield under your control and then that player mills x cards and so this was like a cool mix of having a bunch of big black mana uh, going on like a here's a huge amazing mana sink for me and my cabal coffers to just sink a bunch of stuff into oh man it would be absolutely terrific and then it would also let me fill opponents graveyards and steal from them i'll steal from them with Geth's own ability steal all their mana rocks and steal their creatures. I'll I'll steal from them with a sepulchral primordial. I'll take all of their cards, and 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 no, <laughs> like again, there's an issue of the commander costing a lot, but specifically it just being slow and weird and unreliable when I was trying to get my opponent's stuff because when I'm trying to steal from multiple opponents, yeah, those cards don't all gel 
all that well together sometimes. If I've got one elf player on one side and an artifact deck on another side and then an enchantress player, and I'm trying to get the best stuff from each of those, my side of the board starts looking like a total mishmash and it just doesn't really cooperate. And this isn't just true for Geth. I tried taking the idea behind that Geth deck and applied it also to Lazav Demir Mastermind, which becomes copies of stuff when you mill your opponents. And that was a Demir deck. It opened me up to some other colors. I could steal even more from the graveyards, but no, that one also was kind of struggling. And I even tried it with Rexiel the Risen Deep to steal spells from my opponent's graveyards too. I wanted desperately to fill my opponent's graveyards and then to steal from those graveyards. The problem, the ultimate problem, is that this is A, slow, and B, super enables the Marins and the Muldrothas of the world. Even Spellslinger decks are like, oh, did you put a bunch of stuff into my graveyard? Thank you. My Mystics' Mastery will win on the next turn. I appreciate all of your cooperation. I'm I'm so sad about this. This is a fetch that I've been trying to make happen for years, but it just is refusing to cooperate at every single turn. Well, I feel your pain about the Rexiel having fewer cool targets because of people running less, you know, big seven mana plus cards as well. True. In in the first, having played Rexiel, the first time you swing through, and you're like, oh, I can cast out sort of supply shares and get some pretty good value out of that. That's that's sweet. Except for it doesn't feel that good. <laughs> it's just a removal spell. <laughs> like it, it's useful, but it doesn't really advance your board state. And occasionally you'll hit some, you know, some large draw spell and you'll get really good value out of it. But the the last thing you want is really efficient removal or efficient whatever spells um, when you're going through all of that work. And it's it's just a really tough thing to control too. You're relying on your opponents to run expensive value pieces that you can abuse and cast for free, and that's not something you can always, if if not often, if not ever, rely on. Right, that was the dream. I wanted to have Rexiel steal my opponent's Azuri's Predation, but... I mean, that's like the only eight drop spell in their deck, you know, or I wanted my Lazav, Demir Mastermind to become an Avacyn Angel of Hope. Oh, I'm this indestructible, haha, I've milled it. But like, there aren't a lot of those. It's kind of unreliable. And there are a lot of players who don't have that many creatures in their deck, period. <laughs> like, yeah, if, if my Rexil is going to attack someone and I get to, from from their, their bin, I can cast a reality shift or a stroke of genius for nothing. Uh, yeah, it doesn't feel great. <laughs> it doesn't feel great. Relying upon my opponents to carry my own momentum is an exercise in not futility. Again, these decks can work. But for me, it was uh, a tempo that I found eternally uh, difficult to try and work through. And I think that's kind of a collateral damage, I guess, is the, the right word for this trend that we've seen of, of commander decks. The average mana curve is getting lower, decks becoming more efficient, which means uh. there's less massive bombs for these Rexial decks. Not that there's a lack of islands and swamps out there. Uh, that's definitely not the problem. But people are, are getting their decks so efficient and low to the ground that they're... In 2013, 2012, when Rexiel was a, a much more common commander, there were all sorts of massive seven and eight drops in graveyards because that's what the format was about. And now it seems that all these kind of mind control effects and stealing your opponent's stuff, that isn't really such a viable option anymore because there are less and less of those big juicy targets because, yeah, you're, you're going to be getting the, the reality shifts and the sign in bloods and those types of cards because that's... Those are just so much more common, and it's just hard to find those big six-drop game-winning creatures anymore. Very, very much. And, and you know, like, as we're kind of, like, coming to, uh, you know, the end of the show where we've talked about all of these different things and the lessons we've learned, like, yeah, Matt, that is a huge takeaway for sure, where the format has fundamentally shifted away from the point where Rexiel was maybe in its prime. And there's still plenty that you can do with it. Again, this is just a personal thing that I found with decks like Gath or with Rexiel and stuff like that. But I think also it's important for us to keep in mind that things swing in completely different directions, too. This is one thing that I do think has had a, the you know, the, the slimming down down of stuff has had an impact on commanders like, you know, these that I was just mentioning. But there are also changes that have completely benefited a bunch of commanders and made them more likely to be cooler compared to when I was trying them years ago. Another thing that I tried making, for example, was a Mathis Fiend Seeker group hug deck, which is that Mardu vampire that like can put stuff onto your, uh, put those bounty counters onto things. And when those creatures die, then you and some other opponents will get some benefits from it. That was released before the commander rules change had occurred. So commanders wouldn't technically count as dying. So Mathis just had a very few targets that it could ever use. But this is a lot better of an effect after that rules change. So things might change for the worse for some commanders, but things also totally change for the better sometimes too. And we've talked on here before about the things like the the return to, to useful three mana rocks in, in 
all of us have started running a few more of the new ones, especially. But that's that's still pretty minimal. Like the the switch, <laughs> even some of the 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 swing back the other direction, doesn't do you that good uh, if people are just moving from from two mana spells to three mana spells or something because it has extra gas. When you know eight years ago you were able to cast eight drops or something. Well, and especially looking over some of these examples here for us where we're talking about these decks that never really got off of the ground, I, I think it's kind of interesting for us to, you know, this is a total different subject for sure, but it's interesting to compare those explorations versus the decks where the problem with them was that they were too fast. They got off the ground too well. Like I had at one point a Curic deck, a mono black Curic deck that was so good that I was like, nope, I'm going to scrap that immediately. This is not at the tempo that I actually wanted to play. I've had a Yidris deck that was like, oh, this is this is an issue. <laughs> this is very, this is a little bit too good. Um, and, and so it's also interesting to compare these things that we explored a lot and struggled with compared to some of those things that we asked, like they were so good. The idea worked out so well that they overshot the mark instead. And it's just interesting to try and find that, I guess, Goldilocks zone for where a deck can actually thrive at the tempo that you want it to be in the strategy, niche or otherwise, that you want it to perform at without fumbling too much, but also without like completely shooting the moon either. Yeah, it's such a tricky spot finding a, a commander that you like, and then turning into a deck that you like. Those are two very separate things. If we had a deck for every commander that we liked in theory, then there'd be way more decks out there. But finding decks that actually work around the commanders, that's such a different story. And it's just, it really is a struggle sometimes. Well, especially if you're a veteran player who has multiple decks already, and you're trying to find not only all of those things, but you want it to maybe play a little bit differently than your other decks too. Mm -hmm. um, that th your options get narrower and narrower the more decks you have to try to find that thing that stands out. Very true. But I, I think also probably the final lesson that would be very useful for us to, uh, you know, impart to, to listeners is that also like, end of the day, you kind of got to keep trying. You like, give it a good college try. Like, I think we've each had those experiences where we had an idea and it doesn't seem to work, but like, that was because we might've been exploring it the wrong way. And that's why, I mean, we have spent so long on some of these ideas. Dana, you mentioned that you've been working on some of these ideas for months. I had a deck that I've been working on for like two years that I still couldn't make work, but like, you got to give it the college try. I'm currently trying to build a Shorakai reanimator deck. That's the new uh, white blue vehicle deck that can draw and discard cards. And I'm using a true Truly subpar, but still, regardless, absolutely hilarious uh, suite of White's reanimator effects like Breath of Life or Resurrection. So Shorakai will discard some huge big beater, um, some big angel, for example, and then I'll revive it for four mana because it's me. I have to play reanimation. I absolutely have to. Right now, the first several drafts of that deck that I've made, absolute garbage. Like, like just totally, just very bad. They are not functioning because my ratios are completely bad. My ratios, I don't know exactly how many of each of the things I will need, but I got to give that one enough time. Sometimes the thing is actually going to work. You just need to actually let it percolate in order to give yourself permission to discover those things too. So don't give up too quickly because some of these the some of these things that you'll explore, they just take time to get to know their patterns. Yeah, sometimes you just need to get reps to to find you don't always succeed even if you grind those reps out like like in the case of all the acts we're talking about here, but we also all have success stories where just getting some reps in has let you find those few tweaks you can make to the deck that turns it from one that doesn't work to one that does work. Uh, yeah, Dana, hopefully with enough reps, you'll finally find a five color deck that is popular that doesn't make you sigh when you hear that other people <laughs> have built it. Is that a possibility, do you think? I mean, anything's possible. I mean, I, I just, Dana, Dana, I just don't, I want you to build a deck that you don't scold yourself for playing. <laughs> like you're just sitting at the table like, oh, you, you rap scout. That, that's what Those I'm cards. dreaming of. These cards that are being so good, how <laughs> dare they? <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to find a clip of that, Dana. I'm absolutely going to clip that. As Dana complaining that his cards are too good. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a burden to bear, but luck, <laughs> luckily my shoulders are broad. <laughs> All right, there Atlas, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, let's call this episode to a close. Listeners, we would love to hear from you about the decks that you've tried to explore, but they never quite clicked. And why do you think that is? We'd love to hear from you. But if our listeners want to get in touch with us, fellas, where is it that they can find us all? Matt? 
So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55, that's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash EDHRecCast. We have guests on every single week, and it's always a great time. So make sure you tune in, because it's you just don't want to miss it. I, I'll tell you to tune in, because <laughs> I don't want you to miss out. Of course. And Dana. You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. Um, you can hear me on the other podcast once a week, CMDR Central. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH Recast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz. And you can find the cast at EDH Recast on Facebook and on Twitter. Plus, if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDHRecast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production on the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And we want to thank our sponsors, TCG Player and CardKingdom.com. Plus, you can visit altersleeves.com slash EDHRecast for cool, custom EDH Rec sleeves. Listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then... Remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs> <laughs>